Welcome to Burford, all those years ago, and welcome to my very first virtual historical tour. In the past, I have taken small groups along the streets of my hometown of Burford and had shared what stories and information I have accumulated over the years. However, because of the issues and complications of organizing assemblies of people these days, due to COVID-19, I decided to take my normal live historical tours to the video screen. In this first video, we will be looking at one of Ontario's oldest, most trod interior roads, which originated as an ancient trackway or footpath. This footpath became an important link or portage route between Niagara and Detroit. Parts of this route still remain today as winding, gravel, or paved roads. Though its importance has been diminished somewhat, we will be only looking at that portion which passes through the counties of Oxford and Brant. The section we will be looking at became known as the Old Stage Road. Further west along the Thames River, it was known as the Thames River Road. And as you got closer and beyond London, people used to call it the Longwoods Road or Longwoods Trail or the Hamilton Road. So get your comfortable footwear on, a hat too if you like, and please, if you are in the company of others that you do not live with, mind the social distancing protocols. This map that I'm carrying along is actually a continuous map that I made back in 1993 when I was researching the original trail route and the original stagecoach route. So if you see me carrying it like this, I'm comparing the, the landscape and various features. In prehistoric times, this footpath provided a link between hunting grounds and areas of trade for the indigenous people who first called this place home. In the 16th and 1700s, it became a crucial inland trade route for trappers between the forts and trading posts located at Niagara and Detroit, the Detroit Trail. The Detroit Trail was the only thing remotely representing an interior road connecting the settlements and fortifications at Niagara and those at Detroit and it extended a distance of about 402 kilometers, or roughly about 250 miles. It was used extensively by French trappers and missionaries as a way to avoid the British ships that patrolled Lake Erie. When John Graves Simcoe traveled through this area in company with his expeditionary party, of about two dozen men in the winter of 
1793, they went by way of the Detroit Trail. Simcoe was the first lieutenant governor of the British province of Upper Canada, and he had great plans and schemes in mind to transform the then Upper Canadian wilderness into yet another New England. One of Simcoe's greatest schemes was to build a military road, basically in a straight line from the head of Burlington Bay on Lake Ontario, westward to the site of his proposed capital, which he wanted to be called London. Up until this time, the governor had only seen renditions of maps which had been prepared by his surveyors prior to his arrival in Upper Canada, and he hadn't yet stepped foot in this part of Ontario. On his map, however, his so-called capital of London was yet just a speculative dot on a not yet fully explored westward flowing river, which he named the Thames, which the indigenous people had referred to as the Antler River. The Mohawk leader, Joseph Brandt, summed up Governor Simcoe's years here in Canada by saying, he had done a great deal for this province. He has changed the name of every place in it. Previous to Simcoe's arrival, however, the French had named this river La Tranche. The military road he designed to connect the head of Lake Ontario to his proposed capital of London was called Dundas Street. He called them streets because ancient Roman roads were always referred to as streets. In some ways, the British in the Upper Canadian wilderness were not unlike the Romans themselves trying to civilize, conquer, and assimilate the ancient tribes of this area, like they did in Europe. Dundas Street is a completely different route from the Detroit Trail. Though they are somewhat parallel and lead to a common destination, Dundas Street was basically a straight line, whereas the Detroit Trail was a meandering footpath. As I had mentioned earlier, Governor Simcoe traveled through this area along the Detroit Trail in the winter of 1793. He was traveling in company with an expeditionary entourage, which included government officials, soldiers, surveyors, indigenous guides, servants, and a Newfoundlander dog named Jack Snap. The governor set out from what was being called Newark, now called Niagara-on-the-Lake, on February 4th and followed the Detroit Trail arriving in Detroit on February 18th, which took about 14 days. On the return trip to Niagara, they left Detroit on February 23rd and arrived back at Niagara on March 10th, a total of 15 days. Though they made better time on their return trip and should have returned much earlier, they had lingered at some areas longer and stopped more frequently along Lake Ontario at various settlements. A very prominent leader of the Mohawk people, Tayendanega, a.k.a. Captain Joseph Brandt, along with several of his men, accompanied the governor's entourage as guides. Other members of the Simcoe party were individuals who went on to play significant roles in the Euro-American development of Upper Canada. Thomas Talbot, who was the governor's private secretary, founded the community of Port Talbot, Ontario. He was responsible for enticing 50,000 people to settle in the Thames River area. Talbotville and the city of St. Thomas, Ontario, were named after him. Augustus Jones was a deputy surveyor and a United Empire loyalist. He was the surveyor that not only laid out the governor's road, Dundas Street, but he also completed the initial surveyed outline of Burford Township. 
and Lieutenant James Givens, who was the superintendent of the Indian Department. Major Edward Baker Littlehales, Major of Brigade, was afterwards Sir Edward Baker Littlehales and for some time Secretary at War for Ireland. Lieutenant General Sir Edward Baker was given the title First Baronet Baker of Ranston, Dorset. Major Littlehales kept a diary of the journal, and although the main features and rivers were quite accurately described and placed on a timeline, he had only jotted down simple notations. Then when he was back at home, he actually wrote up the diary. David W. Smith, Deputy Surveyor General, was also a member of the House of Assembly. In 1802, he returned to England and in 1804 resigned from his appointments in Upper Canada. Sir David W. Smith was made a baronet in 1821. Smith also kept a journal of his trip with Governor Simcoe, except that his was more detailed and he wrote it while he was actually on the trip and didn't transcribe it later. 